right. And now we're live. It's, it's going to be a good one. It's going to be a good one. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. All right. Let me just post this in a few places. It's fine. Wow. Already 190 watching, man. Yeah. yeah. There, there's, there's like a huge discrepancy between like YouTube and Twitter when it comes to like Twitter communities. I feel like Twitter is mostly full of like ETH, Solana, and like Bitcoin maxis. Yeah. Maybe not maxis, but like just like really passionate folks. Whereas YouTube, I feel like has more, I guess, Cardano and like those other chains. Uh, all right, all right. We, we can talk about that too. Yeah, I do want to talk about Cardano later too because uh, I have my own thesis on like what's going to happen over there. Uh, I like talking about things that make people uncomfortable because as my handle goes, <laughs> Captain Rational, there, there's quite an interesting thing to talk about Cardano as well as um, Hex. Oh yeah, yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's 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 go then. I'm I'm about it. Yeah. Anyways, I, yeah, people are all right. Awesome. Is everyone is, is the audio fine? Chat. <laughs> Messi's here. Everyone's saying ooh ooh ah ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll see we'll see how hype I get, guys. We'll see what a historical show. All right. So I know as people are rolling in, um, I just want to just give a brief introduction to both of you. Um, I had Noah on my channel, and I think Messi, like when I was first entering crypto, uh, I was like looking for people to follow, like influencers, and Messi was one of the people that I thought was really knowledgeable. Um, really like those threads you put out. I watched at CoinChurch like back in the day when I was like buying things on Coinbase, not knowing right, like, right. the tokenomics of these things. So actually, let's start with Nessie. Uh, so uh, how long have you been in crypto and like how has your strategy changed over the years? Well, uh, you know, so I, I first got into crypto um, December of 2013. Um, and I got into crypto because I was a loser and my wife was not. Our, my current wife was not uh, at the time. You know, she was straight A student. You know, had everything going for her, and I was I was just kind of thinking to myself, you know, if I don't if I don't figure out a way to, you know, to to be a provider, uh, if I don't figure out a way to to be somebody, then you know, she's gone. Like, why would she be with me? Like, she's great. So I, I actually started researching online. You know, how to get rich online. Uh, literally, that's what I was typing into Google. Um, and, uh, you know, I found out about Dogecoin and I'd always been a degenerate. I mean, I didn't have a pot to piss in, you know, I, I grew up very wealthy, but, you know, my parents had pretty much just said like, hey, you suck, you know, like we're cutting you off, you know, you need to grow the fuck up. Or can I curse on your stream, you know, before? This oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I just want to make Un Unfiltered, sure. unfiltered. Yeah, I've, I've kind of got, anything. I, I've been known to have a potty mouth. So <laughs> I, I just want to make sure I don't need to be, you know, cognizant of that. Yeah. Um, but anyway, you know, I, I'd always been a degenerate, you know, I didn't have a pot to piss on just smoking weed and drinking and partying with friends and shit, um, you know, and, you know, other things too. And um, one thing that was always very important to me was having, uh, building my own gaming PC. That's always like every, I got my first desktop and I was like five years old, like compact Presario with like a 300 megahertz processor, like, I, I've been fascinated with computers ever since. Um, and I had a pretty badass setup. I'd worked all summer and, you know, I had a, a great GPU and all that. So, you know, I found out about Dogecoin and I started mining it with my uh, computer instead of playing computer games. And um, I didn't know it at the time, but that moment was literally like probably the biggest inflection point um, of my entire life because I, I came to find a place where I fit in um, really well. Uh, you know, people that were like-minded, people that were just fucking nerds like me. And um, we started having a lot of fun. You know, there was, we, I was mining Dogecoin, you know, originally with the goal of um, getting another GPU. I think at the time there was uh, the ATI 280X was, that was the, the big boy GPU. I had the shitty hundred dollar ones from Best Buy. Um, but, you know, it just became something I was very passionate about, staying up for these launches and, and all that. And, you know, eventually over time, uh, you know, I graduated from college with a computer science degree. Um, and this became my job uh, full time, which was uh, it's funny. It's it's literally I'm, I'm living living the dream uh, and the universe just kind of steered me down this path. Um, so in terms of, you know, how my strategies evolved over time, you know, your strategy evolves. Uh, with the climate, you know, with with the amount of size you have, uh, I didn't I didn't have shit in crypto until 2017. You know, I'm 
I'm talking probably less than ten thousand um, dollars. But you know, it's uh, it's the landscape continues to evolve and change. So I think the best strategy is just to be fluid, you know, and and to see you know, what's hype right now and, and to keep your ears to the ground, make connections, uh, you know, and, and try to determine, you know, what, what the newest trends are going to be and, and where the money is. Uh, so you can extract that. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for the, yeah. thanks for the story. Uh, how, how about you? How, how about, you know, like, how, like when did you get into crypto and like, how has your strategy evolved over the years? I'm old. <laughs> I've been in this shit for too long. So <laughs> tw- 2016, I, uh, I believe I, I paid Genesis mining to mine um, Dash for me at the time. And then Dash was being accumulated. That was, that was like a two bucks. And then, you know, 17 and 18 rolled in and Dash ripped to a thousand bucks. So that was, uh, that was spectacular. Um, I, was, uh, I was living in Orlando at the time. I was working at Universal Studios. Um, I'm a software engineer. I, I write Android apps for a living and you know, amongst other things, diversified. Uh, so I was living in an apartment in Orlando and I ended up building up about 13 GPUs. And these were 1080 TIs at the time. So I was top of the line hardware. So I was mining Digibyte. Uh, that was interesting. That was a very um, exorbitant, lucrative. It was just rolling in just so many coins. And that that was my old school experience with UTXOs, my narrative, my stories, my ideology have evolved into a whole nother level at this point. And I didn't get into financials, really understanding the financial aspect of what we do, probably until like late 2019. And, you know, we, we could, we'll get into that as we talk about what's going on with Avalanche. Um, but my narrative has uh, evolved significantly over the years. Uh, probably back when, when I first got involved, I was younger. I had a very different mentality. And as, uh, as Messi says, it was probably about 10, 15 grand at most deployed at any given time between Bitcoin and a variety of smaller assets. Um, but that was a, a heck of a season, 17 and 18. Uh, very, nowadays, it's, it, these are financial markets. These are financial systems. We did not have what we have now back then. These are, when we talk about Avalanche Boys, we're talking about the birthing of a financial market for a variety of reasons and fundamentals that I could talk about. Yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> bullish things you can say about Avalanche. Uh, but yeah, yeah, thanks for the story. So, I mean, this is my channel, so I'm, I'm not going to go over too much in detail, like what my story is, but. To those that don't know, like um, I got into crypto last year, actually. Um, I played poker professionally. There's a lot of poker players in crypto, uh, but I was low key like Bitcoin Maxi last year um, just because, I mean, I bought it in August and this just like, kept going up. Uh, and in January, I like opened up my eyes to Ethereum and like decentralized finance. And, you know, like, I, I didn't really know what I was doing. Like I was like buying farm coin, like farm tokens and like they were going up. So I was like so happy. And then obviously like farm coins and end up always end up going down and whatnot and when polygon launched in april like i knew that hey like they they're launching 100 million dollars in liquidity mining uh, time to farm the fuck out of the ecosystem and ever since then like i made a new I, I carved out a niche for myself in farming uh and then like identifying like momentum shifts in the markets right so identifying polygon terra and now avalanche so now this, this panel is like people that uh, have different strategies uh, around the avalanche ecosystem Right. So, uh, you know, I, I think Noah has the more the humble strategy, whereas Messi takes on more risk. I'm obviously I'm taking on risk as well. But uh, Messi, let's start with you. Like, wh- like what's currently your uh, avalanche strategy right now? And like, how, how, how did you like discover avalanche and like, sure. like what are your plans um, for it? All right. So so I actually discovered avalanche. You know, I heard about it a long time ago, um, you know, but it was it was kind of just like mentioned among like a lot of noise going on. You know, I didn't initially come over. I didn't initially try to bridge or anything like that. Um, And then I remember, I don't even know, to be honest, I barely remember anything from the last week. I was so sleep deprived. Um, (laughs) It was just one of those situations. I mean, I had to go tell my wife, like, Hey, like, I am sorry for neglecting you for, for this week, but I feel like this is going to be like all hands on deck. Like I, I have to be on this because it's, it's so important that I capture this moment uh, for us. And she, she understands um, that kind of thing. You know, the idea here is that, you know, eventually it's, we just get to hang out and spend time together and, you know, everything's on autopilot. Um, but 
I still remember, you know, I was DMing you and we were talking about DeFi um, stuff and, uh, you know, Catalyst, um, Arbitrum. And I think you had reached out to me and you'd said, hey, you know, you understand that Arbitrum is coming out with training wheels on it. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, you know, there's there's limits on the amount of transactions per day. You know, it's, it's brand new technology. Like they're not going to just release it balls to the wall and, and just see what happens. Like they're trying to be very careful about it. Um, and you said something about the avalanche ecosystem and, you know, I'm a stubborn son of a bitch. So when you, at first, when you said that, um, I was like, eh, you know, like whatever, you know, and, and, and then I saw a post on Twitter the next day, um, about this liquidity mining program that's coming to avalanche. And I started thinking to myself, well, you know, that same liquidity mining program was a major catalyst for Matic, um, was a major catalyst, uh, for Binance smart chain. Um, and I think Binance Smart Chain was more developer incentives, uh, which is smart too. Um, and I was thinking, you know, like uh, my DeFi bags, like the charts look good, but there's really no momentum in Ethereum DeFi right now, you know, for obvious reasons. A, you know, NFTs are all the rage. Um, and B, it's just too expensive to do DeFi on Ethereum. Um, so I, I, I just made the decision and, and I deployed pretty large, but I should have deployed larger in retrospect, you know, I, Retrospect's always a bitch. Yeah. Um, I, I said, you know, I'm, you're never going to forgive yourself if uh, the same thing that happens on Matic and BSC happens on Avalanche and you're not, uh, and you're aware of this opportunity and you don't front run other people's awareness. So I decided to, you know, to come on over and, you know, I use this bridge and uh, the, the technology behind the bridge is, is actually incredible. Uh, you know, it uses secure enclaves and Intel SGX. Um, Granted, there's still a lot of battle, you know, testing and hardening, you know, that, that needs to happen on this bridge. It is new technology, um, but the bridge is really nice. The experience getting over there was really easy. And after bridging and making my first transaction, I was just like, holy shit, you know, like I'm on to something here and, uh, and other people are, are going to have that same kind of emotion, um, you know, when, when they do it. Um, so my strategy, you know, right now, I think a, a lot of the early, like, uh, repricing of things has already occurred. Um, you know, I'm watching bridge flows, uh, because the bridge flows, um, you know, on, on the primary bridge, I think are a good indication of new money entering the ecosystem, which is important when you're looking at this, these hyper growth characteristics, because there's really like 10 good projects to buy. So if you have large flows on the bridge, you have to assume that, Hey, you know, this new money is going to be hitting these projects that I'm in. Um, so, you know, you can expect further upside, you can expect the dips to get bought, but, you know, if momentum stalls, then it might become a more interesting uh, thing to do until that, until those inflows pick back up, you know, to be a farmer and, you know, try to capitalize on some of these high APYs and stuff. And, you know, we're blessed in this ecosystem and that we have auto compounders and things like that for us to maximize our returns in the meantime. Um, but, kind of some, some external factors that haven't really, you know, been thrown into this thesis yet are both the seller and the nerve finance bridges, um, which is really interesting because if you think about Binance Smart Chain and the growth of Binance Smart Chain, obviously, you know, there's the argument to be made that, you know, how is the Avalanche ecosystem going to have the same kind of explosive growth as let's say the Solana ecosystem um, or the Binance Smart Chain ecosystems when, if you really think about what the main bridges were to those ecosystems, at least in the beginning, it was the actual centralized exchanges themselves. You know, Binance, the entity, the exchange was the original best bridge uh, and, and a lot of capital able to be bridged over to the Binance Smart Chain ecosystem. But the thing is, is that people are very familiarized with EVM now. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of retail participants that love the EVM game that have already been onboarded to EVM that have made money in EVM that are looking for the next hype, looking for the next big thing. So the way I'm looking at this is, you know, when, when you have efficient bridging technology from Binance Smart Chain um, and Matic over to the Avalanche ecosystem, it, it removes the actual requirement to have this centralized intermediary like a Binance or an FTX to get people over here. It, it just takes these people coming over and then they're just good to go. It's the same experience that they already love, that they've already been you know, familiarized with. So the Synapse Bridge, uh, and that's Nerve Finance, uh, just went live today. 
I believe that's probably the highest quality bridge uh, that we have at the moment between these different ecosystems. So it'll be interesting to watch flows on that bridge if there is anywhere to watch um, to, to see if, if these retail participants are bridging over and, and taking advantage of these opportunities. Yeah, bridging is really important. Like, I mean, when I bridged over from Polygon to Avalanche, it was kind of a pain in the ass. Like I had to pay like it, I had to like wait like an hour from Matic to Ethereum. And I was like, oh my God, like I need to buy Avalanche right now, but I can't because my funds are fucking stuck in this shit. And then, but like from Ethereum to Avalanche, the bridge is like insane. Like, like once you bridge, I feel like it's like really hard to bridge back just because the experience is so nice. It's like, it's like $5 to bridge. It's amazing. And yeah, like, like you mentioned earlier, like hindsight's a bitch, right? It's just like, I was early, I, I was earlier than most people on Avalanche, but I feel like I played it pretty poorly. Um, I mean, I, I kind of loaded up on AVAX and PNG. Uh, just because I thought those would do well. And I mean, I made money on them, obviously, and they did do well, but I missed out on Joe. Like, I'm, I'm still coping. Uh, and I had, I had access to the teams too. Like, I talked to the teams and I was like, but I was like, you know what? Like, I'll, I'll just be humble, stack AVAX, stack PNG, and then, you know, apes just outperform me. It's like, ah, it, it is what it is. <laughs> and speaking of which, um, Noah, like, I think you also have a pretty good, interesting story on like what your strategy on Avalanche is. Uh, I heard you like bridged today or yesterday. And like, what are you doing with your funds now? Uh, what, what's I've, your strategy? I, I bridged weeks ago just to play oh, around. Oh, really? Okay. It's the, it's the same thing as uh, Polygon, uh, obviously a different fundamental technology. I've been v familiar with Avalanche for a while because of BlockNet. I've had BlockNet uh, service nodes for a long time. I mean, it's years dating back to like... 2017, 2018. So when BlockNet, so Avalanche has been on my radar because of BlockNet, but what catches my fancy is exactly what Messi was talking about is capital flows. And I look at these networks as financial systems and there's critical components to financial systems. Uh, and, you know, the precursor to all this was BSC and, and no one saw BSC coming. And, but when I saw Polygon and we saw that Ave and, um, curve we're going to deploy, uh, I realized why uh, BSC did what it did. And that's because it has the characteristics, components, and the technology, uh, you know, the, the fundamental tool set required uh, for a financial system to function accordingly. It's debt positions, and it's liquidity, and it's a, a capacity for transactions to occur and, and leverage to be taken and, uh, and opportunities to be had. So that's exactly where we're at with Avalanche. The, the, the precursor is set. And the second you top it off with a 180 mil worth of incentives, the amount of capital flow, the second Ave and, and Curve launch, uh, because those are the safe protocols, time tested, mother approved. Who's not going to throw 5 mil into Ave and just get incentivized yield where you borrow 20% uh, tether, you roll it over back into your Ave position. And, and that's exactly what played out in Polygon. You're going to be farming the incentivized returns on Ave. So these are relatively risk minimized plays. And, and, and that's just, you know, free gains. And there you take those, uh, borrowed stablecoin debt positions and you throw it on the curve. Now you got your base APY plus your incentivized returns. And now you're, you're up in uh, your overall returns. And, and for me, um, I have uh, my, my pension or my interest nowadays is relatively uh, risk moderate. I wouldn't say risk minimized because I do have my interest in, in outperforming. Um, but uh, it's, isolated the small parts of my portfolio. So with regard to those, um, uh, that aspect of my portfolio, uh, extra, why? Because it gives you your returns. Uh, the transaction fees are used to uh, produce a disinflationary pressure, a constant buy pressure on the asset, which is uh, very significant with regard to long-term valuation of the asset. Um, and two, it's going to outperform as uh, the capital inflow occurs. So as Messi's watching the capital flow across the bridges and nerves coming online where Binance Smart Chain capital could flow over and Polygon capital could flow over. Uh, and that this is where the uh, exuberance is occurring. That this is, this is the time. This is a good time. Hop Protocol is a... Uh, uh, is has been on my eye as well. That's Polygon back to uh, Ethereum and vice versa. Uh, that these are great places. The bridges, these non-primary bridges, are great places to deploy capital. I mean, you literally you're getting free capital on stable coins. That's basically a savings account. It's basically a money market account. 
Yeah, I, I feel like when it comes to like capital inflows into BSC Polygon than Avalanche, I feel like me personally, like my friends were in Binance Smart Chain in like January and I was like coping when everything's just, they all like 10X their portfolio. So when I saw Polygon, I'm like, okay, like I'm, I'm gonna eat this shit, right? Like I, I just know what's gonna happen. And I feel like Messi, like, I think you missed out on BSC and Polygon. And now you're like, okay, like I see Avalanche miles away. I'm well, this shit. the funny thing about BSC is I was actually one of the first people on Binance Smart Chain. Um, and I had that same kind of revelation the second I got over there um, that, holy shit, why would I use Ethereum when this is so fast and so cheap? It makes everything so much fun because I can, I can make decisions very fast. I can execute on those decisions and then I can say, oh shit, I should have done that. And then just reverse it. And it doesn't mean anything because I, you know, it doesn't cost any money. Um, the unfortunate thing for me was, you know, we got the news that Binance was really getting rid of US people um, and Binance, the centralized exchange at the time. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't foresee how big Binance Smart Chain would come. You know, there, here's the, that's the disclaimer. Uh, when, when Binance said at the time, like, hey, we're getting rid of all US people, I had a shit ton of BNB at like $30, um, a significant portion of my, my portfolio. I had significant BSC exposure. And uh, for me at that moment, I said, damn it, like, this is great, but I got to get out of here because it doesn't matter how well I do over here if I have no way to actually get out. Um, you know, it, it doesn't mean anything. And, and unfortunately, I didn't have the vision to see that, hey, this is going to become huge and there's going to be ways for me to bridge out uh, eventually, you know, down the road. Um, so I actually left right before all of the fun and got back into Ethereum DeFi. I can't really complain. Ethereum DeFi did run, you know, between depending on what you were in, you know, you ran anywhere from probably five, 10 X, uh, you know, in, in a very short period of time, you know, January to February. But after that, you know, you see Ethereum DeFi kind of stalled out and stabilized, you know, and, and the whales farmed that. Uh, and all of the, the apes, um, you know, went to Binance Smart Chain. And of course, we saw things over there that were, uh, you know, borderline absurdity, you know, pancake swab doing 100 X in a very short period of time, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it, it was insane. And yeah, like I, I had a similar story. Like I, I tried to bridge on, but like I couldn't do it from Binance US and like I had to VPN to use like the like the Binance bridge. And I was like, okay, like I don't think they're going to hit like that critical mass liquidity. Obviously I was wrong. And that gave me the conviction to, you know, like Polygon, I'm, a, I'm, a, critical I'm going mass liquidity. That is an extraordinary phrase. And, and as much as Avalanche is just getting started, uh, eyes peeled because... That is everything. Once you have an influx of liquidity, that means a, a, a market actors have a capacity to borrow debt, which means there's debt interest payments, which means there's leverage, which means there's borrowed debt being used as liquidity in stablecoin positions. And that's the, the, the fundamental requirement for the birthing of a financial system, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love money markets. And I, yeah, I think money markets are the most important primitive to have in an ecosystem for it to thrive, right? Like we saw Benki launch and then TVL went from 200 million to a billion in a day. It was absolutely insane. Uh, I'm just gonna share my screen here because I have some things to, that I wanna show. So like on August 23rd, we had $2 billion of liquidity, right? Uh, into Avalanche. And then five days later on the 28th, we hit $3 billion. And Messi, you mentioned earlier something about like, Arbitrum, right? It's like Arbitrum, yes. they're supposed to launch August 2021. And, you know, people are excited, right? Like ETH Maxis, like they're like super excited. Like this is going to be game excited for good reason. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Ar Arbitrum is awesome. Like don't get me wrong, you know. Yeah. Like technology wise, it's, it's, it's amazing, yeah. right? But in the short term, it it's like it's going to be unusable, right? Because they're going to have speed bumps. They're going to place initial limits on the volume activity yeah. and we will gradually raise these limits over time. So it's similar to it's, it's similar to optimism. Like Arbitrum isn't gonna like allow the apes to flourish. Uh, it's gonna have training wheels, and I think in the short term, like ETH DeFi is gonna underperform uh, significantly yes. compared to Solana, compared to Luna, compared to Avalanche, and that's been my thesis all along. And I, I think you, I, he I heard you mention this in other live streams too, but like I, I believe ETH Layer Two in 2021 isn't Arbitrum or optimism. It's Avalanche, right? Yes. Because I think we're all bullish Ethereum in the long term. But in the short term, it's not ready, and there's gonna be lots of copium and uh, by the next the next few weeks. And even then, you know, it's you, you've got the situation where you know we have 
right now, two main front runners for Ethereum, you know, layer two, uh, that being Arbitrum and Optimism. There's also some interesting, you know, ZK technology that's going to be launching down the road, you know, that facilitates that as well. But even then, you know, it's, it's lacking a few things that Avalanche can provide right now. Um, you have an issue with a fragmentation of liquidity, you know, because you do have these, these two things that are trying to capture growth at the same time. Um, and, you know, DeFi is all about composability, you know, all of these systems being able to compose and interact with each other. Um, you don't have that issue on, Arbit or on uh, Avalanche um, at all. Uh, and then, you know, the bridging itself is very important as well. Um, you know, if I bridged over to Arbitrum or Optimism, you know, there's these withdrawal delays um, and people don't like having to wait a week to have access to your capital, you know, to, to take your capital away uh, from somewhere. So, you know, I, I think, you know, that coupled with the fact that you know, we have these incentives coming online for the Avalanche ecosystem um, very clearly demonstrates, uh, you know, who the, the clear momentum winner is going to be in the coming months. And, and I don't know how long the, the mania lasts, you know, is this going to go on for a month? Is it going to go on for two months? Um, but I do know that people love EVM DeFi. And I do know that Avalanche is actually the first opportunity to have a decentralized, hyperscalable EVM DeFi system. Um, so I'm, I'm curious right now to see, you know, long term how this plays out as well. You got to remember that there's not, not necessarily an end. And, and that's what right. I'm trying to retrain the way I think about things. For instance, um, I've recently posted my primary focus is cross chain protocols, protocols that transcend any specific chain. I, I mean, um, uh, Spell, Spell's going and MIM, they're going over to Avalanche. And there isn't any of these assets, even Frax as a stable coin, just, it just goes over the bridge. It's just an ERC-20 that's put in a lock and there's a tokenized representation minted on some other EVM compatible chain. So, you know, I very much see at some point in the future a blurring of the lines. So does it matter what chain you're on? Sure, with regard to transaction fees, uh, the, that is a consideration, um, but um, the, the line will get blurred. And uh, for in the short term, the capital inflow into Avalanche is a no-brainer. We have the precursors, the foreshadow, as, as I like to say. We saw what happened with Polygon. We saw what happened with uh, Binance Smart Chain. The same capital inflow will occur on Avalanche for the exact same reasons. The opportunity cost on other chains is there, and the opportunity is available on Avalanche. Yeah. And yeah, there, it's just that there's so much opportunity cost, right? Like just being in like Ethereum-based DeFi right now, at least in my opinion. Uh, even like when I first bridged funds over to Avalanche, like I, I bridged over like Bitcoin, Link, uh, Ethereum, and Chainlink. And then like a few days ago, I was like, like why am I holding Chainlink? <laughs> like I should just uh, buy more AVEX. And like, I'm like slowly like increasing exposure to Avalanche just because like, like I know what's going to happen. Like we saw this with Polygon and I think it's there's going to be something larger uh, with Avalanche. And I feel like people... I, I feel like a lot of people in the comment section uh, on, on Twitter, YouTube, people think that like they're late, but like oh, they're no. not late at all. I mean, like Aave is going to bring on like eight to $10 billion worth of liquidity. At least that's my con relatively conservative estimate. And Curve is going to be, is Curve is going to be instantly pivotal because what Curve allows for is for like the repegging of assets, right? Because right now on Pangolin, right? There's like zero liquidity for USDC. And right now, the only stable coins are USDT and DAI. Uh, and people obviously are less comfortable with Tether uh, or DAI like, compared to USDC. And if you're trying to swap USDC, like even in like 100K, right? Like you're going to incur 28% slippage. And Curve is going to fix that, right? Because Curve will allow for USDC, DAI, Tether pools for less liquidity. And I'm sure there are a bunch of people that are more than happy to bridge over more USDC to Avalanche when the time, when the time comes. And also, uh, Benki announced that uh, the USDC market will go live tomorrow uh, nice. with liquidity mining programs here, right? So the rates for the other ones will go down a little bit, but I mean, this should bring on more liquidity, actually, because I think US, I mean, Tether obviously is the highest market cap uh, stablecoin, but, you know, there's a lot of people with USDC that... I, I'd, say, I'd say there's two There's two things that I'm looking forward to the most right now in Avalanche. You know, one, that is the curve launch. You know, we have to have that deep stablecoin liquidity. Um, and another critical component that 
I assume will launch at some point is uh, an efficient aggregator, uh, you know, to where we can aggregate all of this liquidity on Avalanche. You know, it's an absolute must. Right now, one of my favorite projects, Yieldiac, um, has not an aggregator, but has a swap function that allows you to uh, route multi-exchange, but it doesn't have the ability to actually uh, partial fill and split orders. Um, you know, so I'm really looking forward to seeing, you know, hopefully a one inch or somebody big, uh, you know, that's already developed these technologies come over here and, and kind of give us the ability to, to have that, that liquidity aggregation. I was a joy on, uh, on Polygon when one inch picked it up and, you know, you had your, uh, it, it broke down the transactions very nicely and it was just basically free transactions when you, know, you do it on Ethereum and you got a $300 transaction, you pause for a second. You're like, all right, I'm going to check out to see what the prices are in Uniswap. <laughs> yeah, no, hundred percent. Yeah. Actually, let me screen share something uh, that I think Messi mentioned it earlier too. Maybe it was before the stream, but uh, generally in the past couple of weeks, the bridging, uh, there's been more, Depo deposits and withdrawals, but today's, today's like the first red day, right? Where, or the net, I mean, the day just started, but there are now more withdrawals away from Avalanche than uh, deposits to the Avalanche blockchain. So like, Messi, like, are you worried about this? Or is this just like a single day anomaly that you're not really worried about? Uh, because I'm, I know I'm not worried about it. You know, and, and let me just explain why. And, and I also want to add a disclaimer to something I've been saying. Um, when I say that we are early, I don't want that to be misinterpreted as I need to be going all in on these things right now uh, after they've run as hard as they have. You know, when I say that we're early, I'm more talking about early in the sense that we don't have this deep liquidity. We don't have aggregators. We don't have a great block explorer yet. Uh, you know, we don't have uh, tools like Nansen yet. Um, there's, there's so much that is coming and so many new projects that will launch. Uh, that will be innovative. Um, so when I say that we're early and that we're you're by participating now, by getting in now, you are front running billions in inflows. You know that that statement still stands true, one hundred percent. But that that doesn't mean that it's up only. Okay, uh, you know there there will be corrections. There, there's a lot of people, especially people that have been believers in this ecosystem for much longer than than anyone here, um, you know, that have probably made significant sums of money. Um, you know, there's going to be road bumps along the way, you know, just, just keep that in mind and, and know that the best way to play this is to think not, Hey, what can I bridge over, invest in and double my money on tomorrow, but more, how can I operate efficiently in this ecosystem, knowing everything that's coming, knowing that billions of flows are going to be arriving um, knowing the deeper liquidity is going to be arriving, uh, you know, how, how can I operate in that environment, uh, protect myself from downside, um, and also capture the upside? You know, you have to remember that the rotation game in this ecosystem hasn't even started yet because we don't have projects to rotate into. There's not these new things yet. Uh, so protect your downside and be very mindful of that. And also, no, I, I do think at some point in time, you know, Avalanche is, is going to outperform the altcoins that are there significantly. Um, so, so I also have significant AVAX exposure just because I've been up in USD too many times in my life uh, to let that happen again. You know, if, if AVAX does run significantly, it's the same situation that happened to BSC, you know, will actually happen in this ecosystem um, because all of the liquidity is versus AVAX. You know, when that happens, if, if AVAX goes to $150, which I think is inevitable, you have to remember that the total value locked in this ecosystem uh, could increase two or threefold uh, alongside with that. Uh, so just something to be mindful of, you know, protect yourselves and wait for the opportunities to present themselves because there's no need to be rushing and FOMOing right now you're so early that if you put your ear to the ground and you wait for those opportunities, there's so many easy multiples to come. Yeah. And I feel like, I feel like we already had this like watershed moment where like a rising tide lifts all boats, like literally everything in the avalanche ecosystem, like went up so much. Right. I mean, yeah, went from like a thousand to like 15,000 or whatever, Joe, obviously uh, outperforming everything else. And one thing that I do want like my audience to know, and I think this is going to be useful for you too, Messi, uh, is that, 
uh, I, I often compare uh, the polygon ecosystem to, uh, sorry, the avalanche ecosystem to the polygon ecosystem. And that's really how so. I drew my parallels uh, with like, you know, why I bought AVAX and why I bought PNG initially. And you, you mentioned like the, the, the rotation game, like back to quality, uh, mainly the native token like AVAX. Uh, if you use Polygon as a case study, uh, the quick swap token, right? Which was the largest, I guess, market cap coin on Polygon. It peaked on April 30th, right? Uh, Messi, do you want to guess when Polygon peaked that? Uh, that was sometime maybe at the end of May. Yeah, so Polygon peaked on May 18th. Yeah. And Polygon on April 30th, when Capital rotation. Uh, when QuickSwap peaked, was at 82 cents. And then it like three and a half X, right? So if I use this as a case study, then I think it's more likely that uh, these farm tokens or these altcoins will peak before AVAX. And there's going to be like a, like a capital, I, I guess like a flight to safety, as you might say, to the AVAX token. And like that, this is why like, I mean, even though like I've underperformed, um, the majority of like the AVAX apes, I, I still hold more AVAX than I do any other token. Because I, I, I do think this is going to happen where just people will like rush into Avalanche ecosystem and there's just going to be some crazy bubble uh, in the AVAX token. Uh, so that's how I'll be, I'll be playing it. Like I'll probably be taking profits, if I do take profits, like back to AVAX and stable coins and uh, just farming with it like once like all of A and Curve launches. You know, you I, know, I will... So. Oh, go ahead, Noah. I'd like to know the supply versus emissions versus disinflation. That's what I want to dig into. Uh, so Polygon is uh, Matic is just inflationary. Ethereum has its new disinflationary component, but Avalanche transaction fees are fully burnt. I wonder what the emissions compared to the disinflationary pressure are. Um, this makes a very a significant difference so that is a very significant different property as compared to what happened with polygon especially bsc um this inflation is a strong uh, price appreciative force with regard to supply and demand pressures and you have to remember just you know that that disinflation component uh, you know increases substantially with transactional velocity um you know and and with all of these things coming to Avalanche and, and with the throughput capabilities of this ecosystem, you know, we, we could see some crazy numbers at some point. Uh, one website that I really like, Token Terminal, I'm sure if you guys are DeFi guys, hardcore DeFi guys at all, and you like looking at um, the kind of things Noah was discussing, you've used Token Terminal, they've just added Avalanche. Uh, so that's a good place to watch um, exactly, you know, how much of that is occurring. Um, part of my thesis moving forward is, you know, you have to remember that even really solid projects like Joe, the Joe token is a farm token. You know, these projects are inflating. Um, and the thing is, is they can afford to do that. That's one of the reasons why I think that projects like Joe and like Pangolin um, are going to be more successful than Ethereum DeFi that comes over to the Avalanche ecosystem, because these projects like Sushi can't necessarily afford to give out the amount of incentives that Joe can, because there's not as many people that are super hype to get on that Sushi train right now. Um, so holding, moving forward, you know, my thesis is that, hey, maybe the momentum on these shitcoins has stalled a little bit because we don't have a lot of new launches. We don't have a lot of new projects coming on. Um, I've, I've positioned myself largely, this is the disclaimer before I say this, uh, into Yak um, and also to Avalanche. Um, and the reason being is that Yak is non-inflationary and that Yak catches tailwinds from literally everything that's about to hit this ecosystem. So I'm seeing it as, as something that more, uh, you know, is able to capture that performance. Um, and, and if we do have an AVAX bubble, um, you know, where AVAX does go to 150, 200, whatever, uh, you know, Yak won't suffer too much in the sense that it's not being farmed into the dirt, you know, by these auto compounders. Um, yeah. just, just something to, to remember, uh, you know, a lot of these tokens are inflationary and with these inflationary tokens that are distributing a lot of incentives, um, there is a lot of incentive to farm those as well. So at a certain point, those are going to become underperformers. Yeah, I totally agree. I, gotcha. I'm, my, my portfolio is number one, eight uh, Avalanche and number two, yeah, right, for the same reasons. And 
I guess one of the mistakes I made uh, with the playing the Avalanche ecosystem is like I chose PNG over Joe as the winner, uh, just because I just I did the too. Incumbent, yeah, I, I thought the incumbent would win because it always had one, and it seems more and more likely that Joe is going to win over. Uh, so, but the thing is, like, sushi is coming over to Avalanche. I don't think sushi goes. Su- sushi's to been Joe. here. Is is the thing um, with, with liquidity mining though? Sure, sure. Yeah. So uh, would, would you? Some. Go ahead. It'll pull some, just like it did with uh, over on Polygon. It pulled some uh, a fair amount of uh, liquidity off of Quick, um, Quick Swap. But uh, you know, but, but you make good points. You know, they're massive, so they don't have a capacity to throw around the amount uh, of inflationary incentives as uh, as the other protocols. Yeah. So, so one thing, you know, of course, I I was wrong as well about the the PNG, you know, Joe dynamic, um, and I bet very big on T- PNG, you know, mainly because of the deep liquidity on that token. You know, I thought that hey, you know, maybe I can roll into PNG and use that as a compounding opportunity where you know I, I'm able to exit, you know, with sufficient liquidity and, and minimal slippage. Um, two things that I think um, here are important to note. Um, one. Joe has flipped P- Pangolin uh, value locked uh, yeah. by a wider margin than people realize because half the value lock uh, on Pangolin is the native token itself, mm-hmm. which more gives you know Joe uh, the the hyper growth exchange characteristics and it more makes Pangolin a farm. Um, you know having that extremely deep liquidity on that token. Uh, available for people to come in and farm and take advantage of. Um, so, so I do think that Joe continues to outperform Pangolin, uh, you know, and maybe I'm totally wrong about that, but um, the user interface and, and the thing that disappoints me about Pangolin Exchange the most is these guys are major incumbents. They've been here for a very long time. They've had every opportunity in the world to innovate, to do something new, to do something exciting. Um, and if you've used Joe versus Pangolin, the user interface is just miles, miles better. People don't want that same Uniswap V2 interface that we were using back in DeFi summer. You know, we've had a long term, a long time to improve on this. We've had a long time to make it better. Um, and Joe is not just an AMM. So it, it also has that one, two punch characteristic of uh, we're, we're going to be, uh, I think they're forking cream. Uh, with the cream team's blessing uh, and launching that very, very soon. Um, so, so they're going to be a hub for lending and borrowing um, and trading. And the interesting thing about that, you know, when, when you have all of those things under one umbrella is that I would imagine it also sets up an interesting environment for leveraged farming and leveraged trading. Uh, so just a couple of things to think about. If they do that and they get, they have a, a debt market, and if if they're that interested in what Cream has done, and they go as far as ice cream, combined with their open market for you know free market buybacks with X Joe, you know transaction fees buying Joe in the open market, that is a heck of a one-two punch, um, and that it, that's more than. Um, enough reason for it to outperform uh, the incumbents as well as competition. Cause that's innovative. And yes. in many regards, even compared to L1 or L1 ecosystem. You know, another thing to remember here is that Joe has uh, an actual allocation for uh, VC investment. Um, and when VCs are able to come in and, and get those good deals, you know, on things like Joe, um, you know, with some kind of investing schedule, then all of a sudden we have aligned interests between uh, developers uh, and money, you know, real big boy money as well. And so I, I think that's, that could be part of the reason, uh, you know, why we're seeing Joe outpace uh, Pangolin, you know, you're seeing Alameda, uh, you know, which if you track their wallets at all, deposits significant liquidity into the Joe ecosystem um, and nothing has been announced. And I don't know anything uh, full disclaimer, um, but, you know, with, with all of these, these things and these little hints, you know, I wouldn't be surprised to see that, you know, the VCs jumped on team Joe, they seeded Joe with deep liquidity and, and Joe is going to be the winner here. Yeah. And yeah, I agree. Like PNG, I think their, their team kind of fucked up. Like they had all, they had so much time to prepare for this moment, but I mean, they, they just lost to Joe. Right. Um, 
And uh, I guess Pangolin. You go for it. We, we, um, I've seen a lot over the years. We all have. And nowadays, I fully rest my hat on old school traditional finance monetary policy. When I see shit that reminds me of the stuff that the Federal Reserve messes up on and what the IMF and whatever the international government agency uh, uh, th- wants to throw at us from a legacy TradFi perspective, traditional finance. And when I see folks innovating in the DeFi space, whether it's an, on Ethereum L1, Avalanche, Polygon, Arbitrum, what have you, that's what catches my eye. When I see disinflationary pressures, when I see share buybacks, <laughs> what they do in the stock market, when I see it going on with transaction fees, then it's real time and seamless. Every two days, Joe's buying back free float, free liquid float in the open market. That's not just a gimmick. That's some innovative monetary policy. I'm talking innovative with regard to historic financial standards. And it shouldn't be glanced over. Here, here's one thing that um, has changed in my mentality over the last two years, let's say. Um, I had quite a disinterest in memeage and food tokens for quite a while. And one thing I hung my hat on early on, and I've reaffirmed in my mind lately, is to peer through the madness to see through the hype and the, uh, the exuberance and see what it really is. And that's monetary policy. Find disinflationary pressure, find share buybacks, find even deflation, burn components. And that is what seriously affects supply and demand the most. No, it's it's interesting you say that um, because you know one there's a component to the yak ecosystem you know that I, I don't think many people have honed in on um, and it's that they what the first thing about yak is that you know if you if anybody here is staking their yak you know that the yield is shit okay um, but the thing is is yak started from very humble beginnings it was very small those initial staking contracts were designed to route the vast majority of ecosystem profits towards ecosystem uh, sustainability. You know, developers have to be paid. Um, the, the infrastructure has to be paid for, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the thing is though, we've already seen hyper growth in the sense that there's almost 200 million uh, TVL auto compounding now on Yak, um, you know, which is substantially higher than, than any other auto compounder yield farm. Um, and alongside that TVL, you know, all of a sudden there's a lot of profit um, that's not being distributed to stakers, you know, and, and the treasury has gotten uh, quite large. So they're actually releasing these new staking contracts, you know, which are going to share much more of, of what's coming in because they don't need as much anymore to take care of developer salaries, infrastructure costs, et cetera, et cetera. And now, seeing as Yak is an auto compounder, there's actually a single sided staking option for Yak. Uh, that auto compounds into more yak. And what that means is that it's taking protocol profits and continuously buying yak off market. Um, so there's, there's serious, serious buy pressure coming into this token um, and, and this pairing. Uh, and, and that buy pressure will only increase as more and more people stake in that auto compounding pool. Um, and as the total value locked of yak increases as well, you know, I'm forecasting probably. Uh, $1 billion in TVL for Yak um, conservatively by the time this is all said and done. So you have to remember when you look at things in, in terms of, you know, trying to price future growth. And um, I think that this, this token is severely underpriced and you can't even compare it to existing, you know, accepted models like YFI because YFI doesn't have uh, this much free yield, liquid yield uh, coming its way in, in terms of AVAX incentives. Um, Joe, or Yak is going to be able to capitalize on every bit of incentive that comes into this ecosystem. It's one, it's one of the few projects that literally everything that happens here, uh, Yak benefits. Um, and, and when that flywheel gets going, I think we should, could see some really stupid shit happening uh, in terms of just non-inflationary asset with huge buy pressure that increases, uh, you know, as, as TVL grows. Yeah. Side of the act, single sided Joe. Yeah. yeah. Now we're I, talking. I feel, I feel like if, if you want to, if someone wants to deploy like a lower risk strategy, it's like 
sure PNG and Joe probably going to go up, but like, like Messi said, like it is inflationary. And once bigger players start to sell, like it could get ugly, but it, with Yak, like you don't have to pick a winner with like, whether like PNG, Joe or Sushi wins, because if the TVL of Avalanche goes up, then the TVL of Yak goes up. And if they turn on like the profit sharing, uh, I guess things that like yeah, Messi talked about, then I feel like Yak is going to be like a pretty safe player. Um, and if like if you want to play the Avalanche ecosystem uh, outside of just the AVAX token. Hi. I, other than stables, I don't do much LPing lately. Um, you know, Bancor is still relevant, and their ideology and mentality with regard to impermanent loss is still meaningful in my mind. And we're uh, we're still early. Uh, we're not just early with regard to Avalanche. We're still early with regard to the, in, the entire DeFi landscape. Um, I, it's good to see the TVLs on these types of positions go up, and I have a great appreciation for um, what it means to take a cut off of uh, – a specific LP position and that reminds me of convex where you know your CV uh, uh, CVX CRV positions are literally taking a cut of every LP position and what you're talking to me uh, when you're talking to me about yak and uh, the amount of treasury they have uh, that uh, that type of uh, strategy catches my fancy no, can you imagine, um, you know, after, of course, Curve and, and such is deployed, can you imagine something like Convex making its way over to the Avalanche ecosystem? Um, and then you have the actual ability then of something like Yak um, to really, really, really take advantage of, of those high yields and stuff. I mean, my strategy here is, you know, I can capture as much of this hyper growth as I can. And when I reach a certain critical mass um, and while these curve incentives and such are live, you know, while everything is crazy, you can just drop everything into stables. And I bet you could auto compound two or three hundred percent APY at that point um, and, and really, really make a killing uh, without any exposure to downside at all. So, you know, I, I do think that, you know, thinking about this in terms of, of actual strategy and, and, you know, getting more into it than just number go up, number go down, like there could be some uh, some insane once in a lifetime opportunities that present themselves in the next month. I agree. I, so don't get me wrong when I say you know I'm not into LPs. Um, I I do have a moderate risk profile, so I'm quite interested in an ex Joe position. And Yak has caught my fancy. And don't and when uh, Ave and um and Curve deploy, <laughs> that I'm going to throw capital there. You know, there's no reason I wouldn't throw like a quarter mil, a half a mil over the bridge and. Whether it's um, whether it's an Ethereum principal position, or or some stables, um, but that's that's the same play we did with uh, with Polygon, where you throw that principal uh, that collateral uh, onto Ave and you just borrowing like you know a quarter mil worth of stables and throwing it onto uh, onto Curve, and you're just getting like 30, 40, 50 percent just. And it's just coming in and it just doesn't stop. And then you take your, your interest, you roll it over into some speculative asset, you turn 10 grand into a hundred grand. <laughs> and it's, it's just, anyway, is there's that a lot of story? Yeah. <laughs> there, there's a lot, there's a lot coming, man. Like there, and, and a lot of theory involved. You see, the thing is, is look, I did miss like this NFT bubble thing. Uh, I'm, I'm a fucking geek. I like numbers. I like theory, you know, the NFT thing just didn't really suit my fancy. I didn't understand it. That wasn't my lane. Uh, you know, and unfortunately, because you know, I, I bet I would have had fun, you know, I did stay out, uh, for most of that. Um, you know, but for me, this is an opportunity for DeFi to get exciting again. You know, I think that there's a lot of people in my shoes that are just DeFi guys that really, really love the, the DeFi game, the game theory and, and everything that comes along with it. Um, and this is an opportunity for us to have our fun too. So, yeah, there's, this is, is it, there's a very important um, overlying statement that could be made about NFTs and, and DeFi and strategy. Um, the biggest mistake I see in NFTs is people buy them and try and sell them immediately. And this isn't a, a diamond hands type thing. Uh, this is, it's important when the, I take what I do very professionally. This is obviously for everyone listening. I treat this as uh, dividend investing, like, uh, like the traditional finance markets. And it is imperative to find conviction. Um, and, and I'm never early and never late. So when I deploy capital, um, it's not for a day. 
it's not for a week. It's probably not for a month. And it's more likely for um, a decent time horizon, uh, like even a cycle, one to five years. I have uh, 160 grand worth of FX, FSX locked for the next four years. I, ha- I have capital locked in VE curve, uh, the, like a, another 160 that's locked for another four years. Uh, so find conviction, find time horizon, and don't, don't look for necessarily a quick gain. Now, don't get me wrong, 10 X on 10 grand flip into a hundred grand. Sure. There's no reason not to, to liquidate. Um, and, but look, look what's happened in the NFT space. You, you flip a punk, which were, were 30 Ethereum and now you can sell it for 150. But, but then in a week or two, you'll be able to sell it for 200, 300. So that's why I like really this, the hashtag time horizon and don't think about selling certain assets and that uh, that means what does that mean? That means entry is the most critical. So like Joe has rib 40 X. I'm, 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 I got my microscope out. I'm looking for that. The early players um, taking their capital gains. And when it hits that dip by the fear and then, uh, then you sell the exuberance. So I want to look to buy the fear. I'm looking for my entries. Dude, I'd do anything for a Joe dip right now. <laughs> like, I gotta tell you that. Much. <laughs> well, yeah, it's crazy because, like, yeah. If, go, go, go ahead, Noah. Well, I don't know if it's inevitable, but here's here's another here's a so it's a lot of psychology, and I think about these things all too much. Maybe it doesn't happen, and that's okay. I remind everyone what we have is opportunity overload. It's okay to miss an opportunity. And, and it might not feel that way, but I guarantee you we're so early and there's always going to be another opportunity, whether it's on another chain necessarily, maybe, maybe, but there will always be another opportunity. So the FOMO, that emotion you have, that anxiety, that adrenaline rush, sure, sometimes it's okay to comply with it and listen to what it says. But sometimes it's the important thing to not necessarily respond and you wait for that emotion to subside and you can find some serious, serious logical and rational entries. Sorry, my, my, um, my, my, my name is, um, is, is, is flapping around captain rational. I'm too rational sometimes boys. Yeah. Well, Let's talk about uh, buying the fear because I, I feel like we've talked about bullish things about Avalanche, but let's talk about what could go wrong, right? Uh, because, I mean, there's a non-zero chance that uh, like Avalanche doesn't do well. Uh, so I have a few, I guess, bearish cases for Avalanche uh, that I want to run through, guys. So first is the token unlocks. So the bunch of VCs, uh, or I guess early investors, let me share my screen, actually. On September 4th, I I, I already know what you're going to say, Messi, but on September 4th, there's going to be a bunch of tokens being unlocked uh, from these private sales. I think these people got it for like 50 cents. So they have, they're sitting at like hundred X right now. Uh, So uh, that could be something that, you know, like maybe some people cash out, right? I mean, how how can you blame them, right? They're sitting at hundred X. And I guess another data point that could be bearish is I asked the Ava Labs team, like when Aave and Curve is launching. And when I first talked to them, um, they said, uh, like late September, uh, sorry, late August or early September. Uh, but now they are saying that like it might be in, in a few weeks. So maybe like there's a s- slight delay in like when that critical mass liquidity will occur. Uh, am, I, am I missing any other like bearish cases? And I guess the question is like, are those like bearish cases enough to like be relatively conservative? Uh, just, just an open question. I, I've heard the, the bearish case for unlocks, you know, be made time and time again. Um, and then the meme always presents itself afterwards, which is bullish unlocks. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, Solana specifically had a, a huge unlock that ever, there was a lot of fight about. Uh, a lot of people were scared about it. Um, and this was back when the Solana token was very cheap, maybe $1, $2. Everybody's in so much profit. They're just going to sell. You know, and, and I think the answer to that, um, you know, we, we can take some of what Noah was saying earlier about time horizons. You know, you have to remember that a lot of the people that did invest in this may be in significant profit, but they're not just investing in it for a quick flip. They're investing in it because they see Avalanche becoming uh, 
you know, a network that has substantial market share in the future of decentralized finance. Um, and I think that that's something that's, that's very possible considering that Avalanche has subnets and things like that. They're going to allow for, you know, these kind of uh, institutional portals and, and, you know, I mean, a government can have a subnet. Um, you know, it, it's, there's, there's just so much growth opportunity here. And, and alongside the deflationary mechanics of the token itself, you know, makes it a very, very interesting longer term hold. Um, but in terms of these unlocks, will there be some that do take profit? Uh, sure. You know, but at the same time, you know, think about how much profit needs to be taken for those investors to be free rolling uh, with zero risk on this investment, you know, other than unrealized gains. Um, think about taking profit and realizing capital gains on that and creating that tax liability for yourself. Um, I, I highly, highly, highly doubt that these unlocks are bearish in any regard. Um, if anything, you know, all of a sudden people go from a potential value to actual value uh, when those events occur and when there's actual value involved, uh, there's more exposure, um, there's more incentive uh, to grow that value, et cetera, et cetera. And last time best. there was an unlock, it hit all-time highs. <laughs> to the last unlock uh, for Avalanche, it hit, like, I think it hit like all-time highs like soon after. It was like a bullish unlock. <laughs> What's the so, total uh, supply increase after all unlocks are complete? Maybe we could get a percent. Like, would increase circulating supply 50%? Would double circulating supply? That'd be an interesting one, as well as the time horizon for all unlocks to complete. Yeah, I don't have that information off the top of my head, but yeah, yeah. this is something let, to consider. Let's say it takes another year for all unlocks. Well, I saw 1.5 for one of those tranches. Let's say it takes another two years. If you pop in a four year time horizon, you're going to have no more transitory. Um, uh, depreciative events where there's a significant amount of uh, liquidity coming onto the market as a sell pressure. Um, so uh, from, in my eyes, the play, the overall macro play for me is uh, as a core uh, AVAX position. It's not going to be too large, um, you know, five, six, seven, eight percent of the portfolio. Um, and it's because, particularly because it's a disinflationary asset as compared to Polygon, uh, which is inflationary currently. Um, so disinflationary peaks my interest significantly. And the, the vast majority overall of my AVAX position will be given free from the, in, the incentivized uh, liquidity mining. And uh, that's something to consider. You, um, and that's my risk minimized approach to the ecosystem overall. But I, that the point being, um, I typically shy away from core protocol assets like BNB I shied away from and even Matic after a while. Um, but AVAX has that monetary policy that hits my fancy. Yeah, it, yeah, the token burns are pretty cool. So I, I kind of want to transition to the topic to like, I guess opportunities elsewhere uh, because we talked about, we talked about Avalanche for like an hour and I, I want to talk about two other ecosystems that interest me personally. Uh, first is being Cardano. So don't get me wrong, like uh, I'm not a huge fan of Cardano. I think it's overvalued like right now at its current market cap, but uh, when they do release smart contracts on September 12th, I think it's going to present an amazing opportunity uh, just because, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm going to sound like an asshole for saying this, but uh, I feel like like when like DeFi on Cardano launches, like when and if it launches, there's going to be so many like retail investors that like have never done DeFi before that's going to just pour money into the space. And I think as a farmer, it, it'll be like one of the easiest farm and dump opportunities of all time. And I, I kind of want to ask this question to you, Messi, because I feel like, my initial Cardano hate came from just like being on Twitter too much, just because everyone just hates on Cardano, right? It's just like, it's kind of like, kind of like a group thing situation where it's like people make friends by just hating on Cardano. Oh, uh, of so course. like, why do you think there's this huge discrepancy between, I guess, Cardano on Twitter versus Cardano on like YouTube, for example? Uh, well, I, I, I think a lot tribalism. of it stems, you know, if, if you look at the, you know, the Twitter tribalism, um, the main tribes, of course, are going to be, you know, the Bitcoin maximalists and, and then you have Ethereum guys. Um, and, you know, I think those two tribes have, have grown to be the largest. Um, and of course, you know, Ethereum guys hate it when they see potential elsewhere, you know, because that detracts uh, from Ethereum, you know, that takes attention away 
from Ethereum, you know, and then you've got Charles Hoskinson, you know, who was one of the founders of Ethereum, if I'm not mistaken, um, you know, so there's there's that component as well, you know, that adds to the hate that he would leave, that he would do this. Um, but, you know, with, with anything that goes, I mean, like as hard as Cardano has gone, you know, you're going to have hate. You know, I hate that that I missed out on Cardano. Uh, I was very wrong about Cardano. I, I had no idea it was going to do what it did. Um, and, you know, it, it's gone nuts and it continues to go nuts. And, and, you know, the thing is, is we're seeing a theme emerge now, though, that you know, Ethereum is losing market share. Um, the issue with Ethereum is that the original implementation and model of Ethereum wasn't scalable enough. And the new or the fixes to that are taking too long. Um, and the ecosystem is evolving too rapidly uh, at the moment for that to be something that plays out well. Um, I 100% agree. You know, I think it's the biggest no-brainer play in the world to, you know, go no ahead way. And, yeah, invest in some of those primitives uh, in the Cardano ecosystem. Uh, there's going to be a lot of people that won't do it at first just because they have this intense hate um, for it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I'm interested to hear what you have to say about Hex, Noah, because, you know, I, I remember you mentioned something about that earlier in the stream, you know, Hex being one of the best performing assets on Ethereum through uh you know, bull bear, et cetera, et cetera. Hex arguably kicking off DeFi summer. Oh, yeah. um, you know, Hex putting Uniswap on the map, uh, really, you know, showing that Uniswap can operate with deep liquidity and, and volume. Um, but, you know, it's look, there's gonna always going to be haters for everything. There's a lot of haters on Avalanche right now. Um, the, the main piece of advice I have is to never be a maximalist about anything. Uh, you should be, yes. an be an opportunity maximalist uh, yes. rather than a, uh, a, a community member, a bag holder of a certain ecosystem. Allegiance to the portfolio. Right now. <laughs> yes. The, look at these gas prices. This is extraordinary. <laughs> is that on oh Ethereum right now? Yeah, Holy this is a, this is a hell. Thing. Someone's minting JPEGs, I guess. Holy it's like, how can you use shit. DeFi? Yeah, it's, it's been like this well, for like a few minutes. Oh, I, I, I'd, I'd refrain myself from engaging in transaction. I personally don't mind, I, and I'm able to operate with you know two, three hundred dollar transaction fees for the vast majority of Ethereum. But uh, yeah, when it's a thousand dollar, two, I'm not doing transactions at a thousand, two thousand dollars. Uh, but that also brings. Uh, I'm not going to digress too much into that. I still think Ethereum has a a, a lot of meat. A meat to it, and uh, and yes, it does price out a massive amount of participants. Um, but the billionaires and the hundred millionaires, they don't flinch an eye at the two, three, four, five hundred dollar transaction fees, and they want the time tested protocols. They're not necessarily they don't want exposure at all to risk. If you throw it around a half a bill, you know you're in curve. You're in Ave. You're in the yes. protocols that have a year and a half and $10 billion worth of, uh, of capital on it for an extended period of time. Anyway. Um, so two things, Cardano, uh, I'm, I'm the anti-hater. Um, I won't, I won't own Cardano. I don't, I, I'm not, why particularly I'm not a buy low, sell high guy necessarily. And you're not going to get a 10 X on Cardano necessarily. Uh, if you want a 10 X, you're looking for something that, has not been found yet. And Avalanche is the ecosystem that finds those projects where you could actually engage with uh, AMMs uh, and not going through $300 transaction fees. So the ecosystem to do that type of, op or expose yourself to that type of opportunity right now really is Avalanche. Uh, with regard to Cardano and smart contracts, I like to say, bring it on, show me an opportunity. Bridge some capital. Show me the AMMs. Show me the money markets. We're going to use it. That's exactly what we're doing with Avalanche. That's exactly what we'll do with Cardano. And the same story is with Flare. Um, that, that's another network that I look forward to. Why? Because that brings... Uh, uh, there's an interesting phrase that I like to use. It's called um, stagnant equity. <laughs> it's when you have a, a $20 billion asset that there's no debt. There's equity in it, but then that that's XRP. No one's borrowing against it. It's a base layer asset, but there's billions of dollars worth of capital that no one's using. No one's borrowing stables. No one's leveraging it. So that's a, a great thing that I uh, 
that I see, and I believe that that's going to be interesting when Flair uh, rolls out. Um, what do you got, Andre? I, I love yeah. reading his stuff. I, I feel like Messi talked about like I, I feel like Messi generally has this like, compounding strategy, right? And like this rotation game, and I feel like the macro rotation game is like in between ecosystems because oh, yeah. I feel like after Polygon, like the other ecosystems, like the other foundations. Uh, learned that hey like these liquidity mining incentives work right so uh, avalanche is just like doing a larger one 180 million dollars and i feel like cardano might do one uh, i think for said like they're never going to give away tokens but who knows like there'll be some uh, incentive and i think phantom is interesting too because their tbl is growing without like with zero incentives and i don't, th- I don't think they want to compete with avalanche right now but this could be like a q4 or q1 2022 play and this is interesting because andre has always had a penchant for phantom yeah, he loves yeah. Phantom. And, and I, I know I know how much good he technology. Loves. Yeah. Yeah. So and the I, bridges. I know how much you love Andre Messi, but uh, this could be an interesting opportunity too. No, I, I've got no I've got no issue with Andre. I mean, that whole fiasco was oh, just okay, stupid. Okay. It was just stupid. You know, I think we both moved past it. Um, you know, he's a super smart guy. He's done a lot of interesting things in DeFi. So, you know, I'm actually an Andre fan. Um, I hate I hate that I got rugged, but you know what? It's part of the game. Yeah. Um, it just is what it is. Uh but move, moving beyond that, you know, if, if Phantom were, you know, to announce some kind of ecosystem uh, growth incentives or, or something like that, you know, I, I think you'd be an absolute moron not to, to go over there and, and, you know, play it as well. It's, I, I think, I think Avalanche though is, was really like the moment for everyone where we, everybody is kind of looking for that, that next moment where they can be early and, you know, maybe the alpha is degrading a bit here. Um, and, and there's a lot of things on Phantom, you know, that have already, you know, had that initial kind of hyper growth and, you know, they're just kind of chilling for the time being, but, you know, for the moment, you're not going to be able to compete with ecosystem incentives. You know, Curve can launch incentives on, on Phantom, which is I'm sure what Andre is referring to here, uh, rather than ecosystem incentives. Um, but you can't compete with, at these prices, $180 million of DeFi incentives. You know, what people are disregarding is, this incentive program can very well become a $500 million incentive program, you know, with growth in the ABEX token itself. So, you know, something really interesting to consider. I agree. Yeah. Like, I mean, I think when they first announced the $180 million, like the price of AVAX was like maybe $30, right? And now it's at 50 essentially. And as, as that goes up, then like there's more and more money flowing to the ecosystem. Uh, and I mean, AVAX uh, right now it's below the market cap of Polygon, which I mean, it's, uh, I think this thing has, like, like Messi said, like over a hundred dollars. I'd say that's What's like the market cap. I don't know. Uh, right now What's it's eight, eight and a half. Let me share my screen. I mean, so I always love to say, why can't it be Cardano? Why can't it be you know fifty, sixty? Why can't it pull a BNB, 60, 70, 80 billion dollars? Uh, we were tempted to think that Polygon would head up to a top 10 region. Yeah, I think Polygon I mean, peaked at like 16 billion uh, before Bitcoin topped. Uh, and if know, Bitcoin didn't top, maybe they would have gone like 25 billion, right? Like we, we never know. So uh, Bitcoin's the king. Are you, are you guys familiar? Is. Are you guys familiar with DeFi Llama? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's one place that I'm watching because, because you can actually, there's a chains uh, tab and you can go click on that. And, and I've been watching that to, to kind of approximate flows between ecosystems. You know, right now we have a, a large growth in, in Avalanche TVL. So I'm watching the Binance uh, and Matic ecosystems, you know, for outflows there um, and making the assumption, you know, before we have uh, these tools in place that, you know, those, those flows would probably be headed to Avalanche. Yeah, Polygon minus 11% in the past seven days. Yep. Avalanche essentially double. Uh, on-chain data. This this is, uh, you know, uh, what's his name that does all that on-chain data? Willy Woo. Uh, there's, Willy. There's a, yeah, there's there's a couple of them. This is this is everything. And this uh, cross-chain flows catches my fancy because I'm a transaction fees kind of guy. Transaction fees are the ultimate sustainable source of revenue. And... Um, that's those are the protocols that will catch my eye the most like hot protocols catch my eye cross chain no impermanent loss just pure transaction fees yeah and like one thing i want to point out is like terra number three with only seven protocols i mean mm-hmm. once once more protocols come on terra i feel like this tbl is going to make me grow uh and i mean I've, I've been bullish luna for a while now but uh 
I think you, you two should look into it because like to- the tokenomics of Luna is pretty insane. Uh, as long as the demand for UST is going up, then Luna has to be burnt, right? So it's kind of like Ponzinomics, but like not actually a Ponzi. <laughs> that, that, that's how I explain it to my friends. It's opportunity uh, overload, guys. They're, they're, you can never own everything you want to own. And we have not even touched on the Cosmos hubs. We haven't talked about Polkadot. Yeah, and Cosmos. we haven't talked about the BSN and the China narrative that I talk about. And they're all connected. They're tied into the digital yuan. We're talking about the sovereign level and, uh, and the CBDCs. There, you can, what, we, what you have to do is opportunity cost analysis, which you do very nicely, Taiki, and 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 you're talking about what is going to outperform the best in the short term. How long is the capital deployment? Is it just the short term capital gains, and you're going to rotate your capital, or you're going to park capital and capitalize on transaction fees? You got to pick your time horizon. Opportunity overload, boys and girls out there in crypto land. <laughs> so I've I kind of exhausted all the topics I want to talk about. Like, is there anything that you know you two want to talk about? Uh, like, whether you're like. Avalanche or any other ecosystem that you're excited for? Messi wanted me to hit on uh, Hex. Yeah. I, I, I like talking controversial because so many folks have their opinions and I have no capacity to assess, uh, nor do I have much interest in assessing on chain uh, who owns what and is it ultimately some sort of uh, uh, conspiracy puns. It's What I understand is that it's a rudimentary smart contract is basically compared to the complexity of other contracts it's baby smart contract and all it is fundamentally boys and girls is incentivize supply disruption with the time lock how many protocols have a time lock component the curve and anyone that uh, you know uh, uh, cream's got their ice cream nowadays pickles got their dills there's plenty of multi-year time lock components so all hexes is a time lock 40% Forty in, percent uh, inflation derived uh, in, in yield, which is nothing extraordinary, and um, one heck of a community and marketing implementation. Um, so, for folks that um, I, I don't have a capacity to say whether there's uh, any manipulation or not, it's irrelevant. What's pertinent is that um, I don't find it much of an impressive asset because I'm not a buy low, sell high kind of guy. Sure, you could buy Hex and watch it appreciate in price and then you sell it, um, but I have no interest in locking it. Um, If you lock it for a day or you lock it for a week, you're getting nothing on your money. Uh, It's basically a very small, trivial percentage return. And um, overall, my focus is weekly returns because I want to produce a salary and I cannot do that with hex. So uh, my, my sentiment and what I, the way I talk about the protocol is it's not very useful at all. <laughs> Just to be honest guys and folks out there in D5 land. Oh, it's not, you know, and you, you've got here, here's the thing though. And, you know, I know this um, left curve, right curve meme has been, <laughs> has been pretty prevalent on crypto Twitter. Uh, this year, you know, when you look at Hex and, and you look at who it actually appeals to, who would lock up a shit coin for 10, 15 years, you know, it's, it's a very left curve type thing. Um, but you know what? The, the left curvers are uh, seemingly in abundance. Um, and and there's, pl- there's plenty of people to do it. You know, the supply, there's centralization there. Um, to be honest, I don't care what anybody says. The smartest thing that I could have done was to realize this um, back in you know December of 2020, November of 2020, gone all in on Hex uh, and just walked away and laughed at everybody as they attempted to make fun of me. Um, you know, but I ended up being rich. You know, the the smart people played the situation as, hey, all the left covers are are going to buy this up and lock their shit up for 15 years. Uh, so I'm just going to buy it and hold it. And, and then I'm going to uh, use the AMM to exit uh, after extreme multiples. But you know what? I, I feel like that opportunity for the most part has has already sailed. You know, there's there's probably better elsewhere at this point. But you can't really hate on Hex. I mean, it it is what it is. And uh, it's performed exceptionally well relative to literally everything else. Valid statement. Yeah. You can't hate on it. It's just not exciting. It's not interesting. It's it's not 
fundamental to a financial system. It's an incentivized supply disruption, inflationary asset. <laughs> yeah, and I, by about, the way, it, sorry, it has sorry, decreasing has decreasing volume. So uh, it obviously the price is vertical and the, the volume is decreasing. So there's a heck of a divergence going on. Yeah, and like speaking of like the left left curve, right curve meme, it's like even three arrows capital, right? Just like one of the largest gigabrains in the space has Dogecoin as their like one of the larger investments that they made. And there was like a recent podcast with Suzu on Uncommon Core where he was like talking so like super bullishly about Dogecoin. Uh, and I feel I feel like like I'm also coping in the in the sense that like I just ignored all these things that, that other people call scams, but you kind of have to have an open mind, right? Because if you don't have an open mind, then you're going to be back holding like ETH-based DeFi and like, like underperforming assets for a long time. You just, you just have to be open-minded and like rotate, play the rotation game. And, you know, just even if like your Twitter timeline is hating on a particular asset, it's just like, you know, don't, don't hate on it, right? <laughs> There's no need for hate. And, and you know, back holding is an interesting one this time around. You know, I... I, I'm in the, a certain mindset where it is different this time. You know, we'll see obviously a cycle in, uh, in the, the valuations of our principal assets, but we didn't have financial systems in 2017 and 18. I didn't have a capacity to get 60% returns on my capital uh, by lending and uh, over collateralized depositions or transaction fees. Do you think in a bear market, Uniswap and one inch and, and, and curve are not going to be doing transaction fees? This, that is technologically different this time. This is not ICOs. So there is something that is going to be fascinating over the next one, two, three years is to really see what is different this time. And I think there's something very, very different. I, I think so as well, you know, which is really interesting because, you know, being in crypto as long as I have, um, you know, there's an old mantra, which is there's only the pump. Um, you know, these things get pumped and they get dumped and that's it. You know, that's just the way it works. But, you know, I'm, I'm having a lot of difficulty right now um, adjusting my way of thinking about these things, you know, but I think you're hundred percent right in that, you know, investing in some of these DeFi protocols now would be akin to investing in, uh, you know, some of these early stage uh, internet companies, um, you know, way, way, way back. I'm sure people here have a grandfather or somebody they know that invested big in IBM or, you know, another company like that, that ended up making big, you know, they ended up, you know, becoming a large part of the future that, that we occupy. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, yet who, who ends up um, in that slot? You know, I, I don't know, is, is Curve the one that makes it? Is Ave the one that makes it? Um, you know, but I, I do think that, you know, having that longer term horizon, you know, could end up being one of the best investment uh, decisions, you know, of my life, if I'm able to even pivot to, to that kind of thinking, you know, which is something I'm still really struggling with here. Um, but I see the argument for it. You know, I, I think the argument's very sound. Uh, and I don't think enough people are thinking about that argument right now. I wouldn't entirely discount uh, old school methodology as well, which is obviously not consistent with my current methodology, but buy low, sell high capital gains. And at the end of whatever the cycle may be, stable coins, they work. <laughs> Get returns. There is the, what fascinates me the most is no matter what, whether DeFi may become what we think it may become, whether it's just different this time or it's not. There's literally no reason for stable coins to exit the crypto space. There is no yield in legacy finance. You get jack shit in a bank account, you get nothing in the legacy financial markets, and you're getting double digit percentages on your stable coins in the crypto space. I think that's a really good point. You know, it was a, a lot of people, of course, have made fun of Sue uh, relentlessly for his super cycle theory, you know, but one of the biggest supporting factors to that super cycle is that capital, you know, has no incentive to exit this system now. Um, and now we exist in an environment where the base unit of liquidity for everything isn't an extremely volatile asset like Bitcoin, uh, you know, it's dollars. So, you know, when, if you do want to play the capital gains uh, game, you know, if you do want to, uh, you know, capture momentum, um, you know, there's an opportunity now for you to 
capture that momentum uh, and then remain exposed to the ecosystem and, and, and be ready to sit there and buy the dip. Now, I don't know, is Bitcoin uh, bottom in? You know, I've, I've got a really good feeling it is, but you know, you can never be too certain. Um, but if it is, then, you know, that was a very short bear market. And, you know, I think the retracement was what, about 50%, right? Um, and that would be the shallowest, you know, retracement for a cycle uh, in Bitcoin's history. But another interesting thing is if you look at the actual structure of Bitcoin at the top, um, it wasn't a parabola this time. You know, it is if, if you look at it on, on, on certain time frames, but it wasn't this mania blow off, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the liquidity in this ecosystem is, you know, substantially improved uh, relative to even what it was in 2017. And now with the amount of stable coins we have here, you know, it, it could become the situation where it's a self-fulfilling prophecy where Bitcoin does become a store of value where the volatility is reduced. Um, so it's, it's going to be interesting to observe that dynamic and, and the impact of stable coins of this ecosystem and, and the capital being parked in this ecosystem and not leaving. I think over the next coming years, uh, you know, things could get very interesting. This doesn't have to just, just bubble and be three year bear market. In other words, you know, there's people that, that are ready and waiting to get back in, uh, support these markets, support the ecosystem. The most incredible thing I've seen here is you see these uh, industry incumbents like uh, you know FTX, Coinbase, um, that are investing big in the ecosystem this time, whether rather than just extracting all the profit and, and not putting anything back in. Um, you know, Coinbase, of course, you know, with five hundred million dollars in crypto purchases, which yeah. is very interesting wording, um, and also a commitment to, to continue to push revenue uh, that they generate from this ecosystem into, you know, reinvesting in the ecosystem. I mean, there's some interesting dynamics here that we've never seen before. Uh, so I think we're in unprecedented territory, and it'd be very difficult to forecast how this plays out. I agree. You know, it's interesting. Um, you know, the sense I get just from a social media and I, my personal uh, sentiment, what we've seen since like, you know, a good part of March, uh, from March, 2020, which ended in like September. And then it was a lull until about January. And it obviously ended with our most recent top. The leg legacy finance sees that as exuberance. Yeah, we've seen, we know what exuberance feels like and we've seen it on the micro uh, scale with um defi summer isolated and bsc and then polygon and what we're i don't think we've seen it yet with uh, avalanche the sentiment i get between march of 2020 which was basically the start of our overall larger scale cycle you know coming off of 2018 misery three thousand dollar lows on bitcoin um I get the, my sentiment is this is a lot, just capital inflow. I don't get the sense that this is like that par parabola or that exuberance of the overall market. I just feel it's capital inflow. And that's the, the you know, the narrative changing for what this really is. Yeah. Yeah. Same, same for me. Like, like once you like bridge, once you like on ramp into DeFi, like it's, I just like have no incentive to like bring you back to fiat. Right. Uh, so I have a question for you guys. Like, I just got my girlfriend to get on, get on BlockFi, right? Because she's like, what's farming now? Can I try? And I was like, okay, like, just do BlockFi first. Like, you, you two have, like, what? You two are married. Like, have you gotten your significant others into, like, like crypto, like, farming, I guess? I mean, I know, like, BlockFi is, like, it's not really farming, but it kind of is, I guess, from, like, a more normie standpoint. You first? I haven't. I'm I'm the crazy crypto dude. Nobody gives a <laughs> shit what I say. Um, you know, to their detriment. But uh, you know, it's it's been that way for a long time. And uh, you know, it, it, I remember early on, I was more um, enthusiastic about you know sharing my passion with with those in my family and you know people, friends, even uh, people that were close. But you know, the further and further I got into this ecosystem, you know, I just realized that you know I can you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. Um, you know, and I had tried to lead the horse to water and, you know, I wasn't going to beat the dead horse and uh, continue to try to, to help these people, you know, make money and expose to, to a bit of risk in this ecosystem. Um, it's their loss and, you know, it just is what it is. 
I agree. That's so spot on. You can't, you can't, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't force them to drink. So all my family, uh, no matter what age group, no interest. Uh, and what I tell them, it's literally just think of it as banking and get two, three, four percent on stables and Ave. And they're just, they don't even know what banking is. They don't even know. They don't, they're so departed from even rational financial management, which is a good part of how I handle my stream is just rethinking financials and, and capital management. And yet alone, what we do is more than just managing capital. We're just, we're aggressively attacking opportunity. But my wife, I have uh, some, she knows what I do, everything top to bottom. Not that she could do it, but she has a, a decent set of instructions that I put together and she knows how to use one inch. She knows how to use Gemini. She knows swap it to GUSD and that's your capital offer to Gemini. Um, she's never going to be able to figure out how to how to liquidate like a, a block net service node or a syscoin master. No, that's another story operating through the um, through a terminal and and uh, so on and so forth. But um, uh, but she knows how to get convex yield. She knows how to how to, oh, how to that's that's how badass, to Noah. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty good. I mean, she, uh, the, the the one rule she thinks is. Uh, that if I, anything ever happened to me is I'm not going to sell anything. So she promised me she won't sell it and she'll just take the yield, the profits. Yeah. Like funding is so addicting. Like once you like start making money, because there's, there's like this quote uh, where like 90% of traders like lose money, right? Or is it like they don't, they're not winning traders. But I feel like when it comes to farming, 90% of farmers make money and 10% just like they take on too much risk and get rubbed. Uh, I feel like farming is like much like much more friendly your introduction to crypto uh, and DeFi, and once you understand farming like you can pick out these ecosystems like the reason i knew avalanche was going to be big was because i was i was farming on polygon and like the reason polygon did well was the, the liquidity mining incentives right uh, so yeah i mean whenever i tell my friends that like i do like a yield farming channel it's like they <laughs> they look at me funny it's like what the fuck is this guy? <laughs> I, I went to school with this guy uh, but yeah i mean it, it just means we're still early and yeah it's crazy things we can do like stable coin yields are insane uh, etc that's why i frame it all in, in legacy financial terms because that's hard enough people you gotta understand the vast majority of people that ever hear you probably have credit card debt and spend more than they make and and don't think of the dollar as what it really is the dollar is an asset uh, are you buying dollars are you investing in dollars today <laughs> So you you work at the end of the week, you get a paycheck, your paycheck is denominated, let's say in work and your employer is choosing to buy you dollars to give you dollars. So I, you know, I try and turn the tables on a lot of uh, what's accepted as status quo to get people to think, you know, this isn't gambling, boys and girls. I treat this very professionally and yield is real. The yield does not exist in legacy finance. And the reason, a good reason, everyone that hears me every day when I stream, and it's, it's, it sounds strange. These topics sound strange. It's because there is no damn yield in legacy finance. It doesn't exist. There's nothing strange about interest and yield and returns for your capital investment. It's just that it's done. You know, you get three percent on a, on a stock that's negative two percent, uh, you know, inflation adjusted. So the real yields are negative. You're screwed. But you could you could actually make this whole thing work in the crypto space. Yeah. I, th I feel like everything that we're seeing right now, you know, with an abundance of yield, et cetera, et cetera, you know, was was something that the previous generation, you know, once upon a time saw in the legacy world. Um, you know, this is an opportunity for for my generation you know, to come in and, and, you know, have that same upside as they did. Um, and, and I think, I think that we're very early here and in, in that regard, you know, we're still, um, you know, to the point where, where the people that are really benefiting from this are trailblazers, you know, are pioneers, you know, and, and of course we're having these on ramps and, and portals, you know, for people that don't want to get their hands really dirty, um, you know, to come capture these yields. You know, I, I, I do have uh, friends, and, you know, friends of family, you know, that have asked me about things like BlockFi um, and, and stuff like that, you know, and, and even like my dad's friends and stuff, you know, my dad's too proud to ever do anything, you know, that I, I would talk about, um, you know, but his friends know that I've been very successful. And, you know, they've asked me, you know, things like, what do you think about this? You know, I can give 5% of my dollars, you know, that's 
they think that that's lucrative. Uh, and, and they're always shocked when I say, oh, you think 5% is nuts. Uh, you know, if, if you want to get your hands really dirty, how about this? And they're like, oh, no, 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 5% is good for me. Um, but, you know, that, that's kind of just where we're at right now. Yeah, I mean, when Curve and Aave launches, like the yields are going to be insane. I think when uh, I think when Curve first launched on Polygon, you can earn 30% on stables. <laughs> it was absolutely insane. Uh, and uh, th that like that's going to bring on so much liquidity and yeah it's nowadays we're discount. old we're old in DeFi when we could say i remember 80 percent returns on stablecoin positions directly on curve i i i had curve i was i was a liquidity provider on curve before the curve asset before the curve dow and they they threw around so much in that and that vested over the, the just recently finished vesting, but Curve, um, it's an interesting story. I very much look forward to uh, Curve on Avalanche because I know exactly what it's going to do. Uh, th the DeFi space is littered with uh, what's called a literary foreshadow, but it's with technology in this instance. But what happens in, throughout history tends to happen in some shape or form. History is that whole trade uh, stock chart or chart uh, idea where history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. So that's exactly what we just saw with Binance Smart Chain, which led to Polygon, which will lead to Avalanche for the exact same reasons those financial systems uh, experience what they experienced. Yeah, exactly. And Curve isn't just like going to bring liquidity and like, you know, give stablecoin yields. It's also going to Pave ways for other crypto, uh, crypto decent like uh, crypto applications to create products, right? Because, like I mentioned, like I, like I showed earlier, like there's zero liquidity for USDC right now uh, on Avalanche. But when that does come online, then there's going to be all sort like all sorts of products like that's going to like center on USDC Dai Tether. Uh, like for example, like Iron Finance, right? Like I'm pretty certain that Iron Finance that that team is going to make something on Avalanche. God, that hope. team like. Like that team makes amazing Ponzi's. Like I've researched all of their products and like they make the best Ponzinomics. It's actually kind of insane. Like, so uh, like every single Iron Finance Ponzi just like collapses at the end of the day, but like anyone <laughs> hey, that's early yeah. will make a fuck ton of money. I'll, that's always, why be, always be at the top of the pyramid, you know? And, and I don't think people realize just how awesome Curve is too. You know, I, I just want to discuss this for a second. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. the, the token economics are absolutely extraordinary um and then with curve v2 i don't i don't think people realize you know what a how serious of a competitor it is outside of stable coins in the amm space um those guys are are smart as hell and uh if you really dig into what they built and the capabilities of the system i mean we're just at the tip of the iceberg right now it, it can get uh it can get really really weird really fast um if if we start being able to even explore some of these new technologies and we need places like Matic, like Avalanche, uh, where, you know, like Phantom even, you know, and, and I think Curve can really come and thrive there and, re you know, realize its full potential. Um, and then too, you know, I, I haven't delved as much into this, but, you know, Noah's really big on uh, AMM positions as part of portfolio optimization. You know, and there's a lot of interesting theory, you know, behind that. Curve's a big part of that. So um, super interesting stuff. You know, I hope we get to discuss that more at, at, at a date soon. My pleasure. We'll schedule some time. And my my pension, guys, is uh, I want to own this. Sh I want to own this shit. <laughs> as much as it's nice to to, to have a capital gain, and you got to remember, like if you buy an asset at a dollar and it goes to fifty dollars, you just sold the asset that you potentially really really like, and now you don't have it anymore. And that's kind of like the same thought that I, I have about like NFTs. You buy an NFT really cheap, you sell it, you sell a punk at 200 ETH, you don't have it anymore. So um, that has always stuck with me. Like I don't, like the assets that I've identified, I really appreciate them more than just wanting to sell them to experience a capital gain. I think these assets will work for me so I don't have to work for myself. And, and that's my goal. I want assets that will just crank out revenue for the next 50 years and and that's uh, that'll make me happy. <laughs>
Can you imagine a future, you know, to where you're hundred percent right about that? And you were like one of the early investors and, and the infrastructure, you know, behind uh, finance itself. You know, I, I think 20 years from now, if, if any of us end up being correct, um, you know, you could look back on, on these moments and you could be like, wow, you know, if I had only, if only I had known, you know, how crazy this would be. It's the same thing as, you know, and, and this is much smaller scale, but when I first got in the Avalanche ecosystem and I put like 20% of my portfolio over here. And then three days later, I was like, holy shit, I need to move like 50% plus like right now um, because this is, this is it. This is an opportunity. Um, it, it'll be one of those moments where you look back and in retrospect, you would just be like, damn, why didn't I just all end this shit? You know, I, I, my whole family would be set forever. Like this is, it could end up being yeah. a wild opportunity. And even if it's not like the, there's very few opportunities you know, in today's investment climate to where you have that level of risk reward, you know, even, even if you yeah. are wrong, you stuck your neck out and you took the risk out or you took the amount of risk appropriate to end up being a legend, uh, you know, for maybe potentially generations, you know, which is a really yeah. interesting thing to think about. Yeah. The EV of Avalanche is so high. Uh, and that's something I kind of, I kind of didn't like think too hard, I guess. Cause I, I was like pretty early. Right. Cause I, I think I was one of the first persons to like tell you about Avalanche Messi, but like, I only bought like AVAX and PNG, but I obviously should have like I diversified more. Uh, but yeah, like this two weeks ago, this is three weeks ago, a month ago. Yeah. <laughs> and just like, yes, we're they're, very they're, early. They're, they're your banana suit. I'm like, okay, yeah, no, Nessie's completely right. I, I have to like gain a little bit more exposure. <laughs> I bought some like chain link bags. I mean, I mean, I like, I like chain link, but like there's opportunity cost. Yeah. Right? And like there's, you have to build conviction and, yeah, like well said. Yeah, it's, and yeah, I talked to you, Messi. Like, like you just like flipped. Like you just like because a lot of people that I tell, I, I guess like a lot of the OGs that I like talk to, they, they kind of have their eco chamber of like you know only ETH, only Solano, like only trading. Uh, but like you like flipped on a dime. It's like oh yeah, like you used it, you bridged over, you used it, and you're like okay, like this is this is gonna be big, and like props to you for that. And you know, I think I think. I think I think in the next coming weeks, more opportunities will come. Uh, Curve and Ave, like more billions will flow in, uh, and like more DAFs will come in, and like oh hell it'll yeah, it'll be a farming galore. Like I'll I'll be farming the hell out of Avalanche. I can't wait, man. You have no idea how excited I am, and and you know what? Like I I I keep trying to like check my own euphoria, but you know I I keep trying to remind myself also that. Are, am I euphoric in this moment? Yes. But is that euphoria more like of a byproduct of what's already happened or just being having the amount of conviction I do have about what is going to happen uh, and soon? And I, I definitely think it's the latter, you know, like having this amount of conviction, having seen this played out so many times, understanding how it, exactly how this is going to play out, formulating a thesis, having a plan. Um, it's very, very exciting. You know, I, I haven't had this much fun since DeFi summer, really, if I'm, if I'm going to be honest. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's so fun when you can, like, transact for, like, under a dollar. Because, <laughs> like, the like cost I'm... of making a mistake on ETH is so high. You just, like, have to pay 100 bucks or whatever. But, like, you know, it's, it's but, like, yeah, everyone loves the EVM experience. It's, it's really fun. It's seamless. I'm very much, this, the second Ave, and curve launch, uh, I'm gonna have a lot of fun. But uh, X Joe, uh, that's my position. Yak, you got you got me on that one. Uh, I don't say I don't care about one percent return, two, three, four, five, six percent return. I I have a time horizon, and I have no qualm having a decent time horizon. And I'll end up thinking of an, an X Joe position. Whether it, you know, I'll wait for an entry. I'll wait for a good, uh, you know, by the fear moment. But I don't. I wouldn't be thinking of uh, liquidating it. Uh, I'd be taking a position to purchase it. I own it. It's not for sale. I'm buying a return, a, a, a weekly revenue stream, and that's a that's something that I. That's the way I think about a lot of my value allocations. I mean, can you, I, I love that way of thinking because you know investing in something like Yak could definitely be you know, thinking of like, hey, I have access to um, basically future yield as long as this ecosystem is in existence and I'm able to purchase that future yield uh, yep. for this static price. And, you know, it's, it's a really interesting way of thinking. Yeah. It takes, really it takes like, a yeah. lot. You gotta, it's hard to get a, 
it's you know it's because it's hard to 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 detach yourself from dollar denomination and to think you bought something and i've watched i've had a curve position that's gone from like 1.4 1.4 down to 600 back up to eight up to 1.6 mm-hmm. the volatility will drive you nuts but you have to detach yourself volatility um will drive you nuts yeah the, i mean yeah to, to, to like talk more bullish things about yeah it's just like yeah just yep. because it's like not inflationary like the downside is mitigated too right because if there is like a sell-off in the avalanche token or whatever like every farm token like joe png benki i think they're not going to do as well as something like you know yeah just because i like, think like, if you are farming joe or something or png like think about how much tokens you have and then think about how many tokens everyone else has right mm-hmm. and to many people like like these farms is the revenue source like i interviewed cole zero x from a vc firm and like there's just like farming and dumping these farm tokens because that's how yeah. they make money uh, and at some point, like people will take money for profits. And I think there's going to be some inelastic, like, I think the, the sell pressure for those like farm tokens are going to be like relatively inelastic, right? It's they're just going to sell uh, when they can, because like, I mean, just cash out to AVAX or stable coins. So uh, that's also like one of the reasons that, you know, I think I like Yak, uh, not only Messi, I, I know this, but like Messi, like <laughs> does more research than me, uh, but like if they turn on profit share, I'll be bullish and, I, I see Yak is just a bet on TVL. I mean, Yak is just a bet on Avalanche TVL, right? And that's a that's an amazing risk risk reward, in my opinion. Like huge, like super super plus EV bet. X Joe Yak and and Ave curve to build a free Avax position. I think um, you see, I'm I'm never early. I don't need to be early. I just I need to find my path, and then. You bear in mind that these uh, the 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 XJO and the Yak those will be purchases, you know the liquidity, that's uh, transferable. You pop it on uh, on Ave, get your debt, and you know you know that whole game. You just borrow capital, you throw it on Curve, and you get in free incentivized yield, and you build in a free position. So that you bridge back uh, when the time is right. If uh, if uh, uh, volatility in the market and the the the, the amount of debt, the leverage peters down and now you're following capital flow maybe capital flows back to to polygon maybe capital flows back to l1 maybe arbitrum gets hot maybe it doesn't but you you react to the market you move, move your capital according to opportunity cost analysis watch your downside exposed to upside and purchase revenue streams boys and girls out there in DeFi land purchase them revenue streams so I, I have one one question for Messi because uh, I, I know you have a pretty large like bag of like avalanche native tokens. Like what like, what is your profit taking strategy? Because this is something that sure. I like consider. It's because when I when I was thinking about it, like I didn't want to reduce. I took some profits on like other tokens like PFI, uh, Snowball, etc. And but I still didn't want to uh, like I still wanted exposure. So I just like went into like the safer bets like Avax and Yak. Yeah. But like let's say in the like next. next Let's say our thesis plays out uh, in September, right? Like, how would you be taking profits? Uh, well, well, it's it's the same way, you know. Basically, the idea here is that you know no one can call bottoms and tops. You know, that's that's a fool's errand. Um, so the only way to actually exit here in this climate, like a king, is to dollar cost average out. Um, it's very difficult to do that when the number is going up much more difficult than, than you'd realize. It's much easier, in my opinion, to be a buyer than a seller. Because when you're selling, you're, you're not only selling the asset, you're not only realizing capital gains, you're selling your dreams. You're selling your dreams of making it. If I sell, I'm not going to make it. Um, so the way I, I plan on executing, and, and this is what I did um, with that run in DeFi in February. Um, although, unfortunately, you know, I got greedy and bought back in, but hey, you know, it shit happens, um, is, is to sell into the mania um, and to do it over time. I don't know how long the mania is going to last. Um, I don't know how extreme the mania is going to get. Uh, And if I plan on averaging out over a period of maybe a month, uh, maybe two, um, that, you know, that sets me up to be able to um, capture all of the upside, um, reduce my downside risk, uh, not make a huge splash on any market. You know, I've already done that kind of initial rotation of quality 
Um, I never rotated my PFI, um, you know, because they've got a launch pad and, you know, I, I know launch pads are super hot. Um, so, you know, I want to be able to have that access to the new shit that's coming out, especially because there's no options for rotation right now. And having that portal, that access to the new shit, uh, at least the no KYC new shit, I think could end up being, um, free multiples, you know, just cause people are, people are dying to ape into something right now, you know, like we've already had these shit, you know, it runs, this, this place works. Uh, there's money coming in. We, we need some new shit to buy. Um, so moving forward, trying to focus on those blue chips, the ones that we know are going to catch tailwinds like Yak, like Joe, you know, I, I think there's no reason to take unnecessary risks when you do have these blue chip incumbents that are going to do multiples anyway. Um, with deep liquidity, um, you know, I, I want to have some exposure to the meme coin scene, you know, the left carvers love coming in and, and buying the meme coins. And, and if this ecosystem really takes off and you get those retail flows, they're, they're not coming to buy my yak back. They're, they're coming to buy my dog coin. Um, they're coming to buy my ape coin, you know, whatever. Uh, so, you know, I, I do think it's important to have a bit of exposure to those, at least from my ex- uh, perspective, but primarily focused on the blue chips. There's no need to take unnecessary risks. There's going to be tons of opportunity coming. Um, Oh my God. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) There is no second best. No, no, to be honest. So, so that meme, in in my opinion, just like embodies like the way I've been feeling the last week, you know, and and when I see Michael Saylor there, you know, I, I just, I feel like he's so focused, you know, he's so, he has this such a high degree of conviction and he knows because he's done his research he knows that he can't lose. He's almost, it's almost like he has seen the future. Um, so that's exactly like how I feel right now. You know, like I'm onto something that, and other people don't realize it yet, but, but I'm a hundred percent conviction to where I know that what I've done right now, while it may be seen as maybe even borderline insanity by a certain group, I know that it's not, uh, that's why, that's why I love that meme so much. When you see something that's so obvious and others don't, that's exactly what Sailor's face is right there. <laughs> so, two cents. No, 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 it's the. Oh, he's. <laughs> there is no second best. <laughs> there is no second best. Yeah, there is no second he, best. He's 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 spot on. Uh, he's very he's obviously far out, but some of the smartest people this, in history are far insane. out. But yep. that's that that's not necessarily uh, to be taken derogat- in a derogatory sense. He's crazy. It's that's fucking insane, awesome. Yeah. I love that's him. That's awesome. Well, look, Elon him. Musk is arguably fucking crazy. He's out of his, you know, know, crazy. Out of his goddamn mind. Steve Jobs, out of his goddamn mind. You know, out of their minds. Yeah. It just yeah, is, Taylor is insane, dude. Like, I mean, I love like, him because he made, he made all of us so much money, but like <laughs> these memes are insane. It, he's, he's definitely like, well, that's special. Or something. Dude, memes are everything. So the trends, influence, uh, uh, ideas, the transmission of, uh, of, of just being able to convey an idea over a meme is, is meaningful. So I, I, do, I don't, I like to peer through the madness. I like to see things for what they are. And that photo and his presentation, whether it's in meme form or the original, he's extraordinary. And he sees something that most do not. And that's meaningful. I agree. Yeah. Nothing, yeah. nothing but respect for Sailor, like at all. Like he is, I love, I love the fact that he has a vision and that, that vision, that conviction is literally unshakable. You know, people make the joke that every single time Michael Saylor finds a, a quarter under his couch cushions, you know, he's going to buy more Bitcoin, buy Bitcoin. To make it. Yeah. He's going to make an announcement about it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, like that's, that's the thing is he's not a Bitcoin maxi. That might be a misconception. He's not a Bitcoin maxi at all. Have, if you've ever, he talks about the, the four quadrants. He got, you dig in. He's not, he, he is not a Bitcoin maxi, I'll, which is I'll, absolutely I'll fascinating. Some, I'll do some digging. I, I really am interested in hearing more about that. He, he yeah. talks about the four quadrants and he talks about everything that we're talking about today in Avalanche and DeFi and whatever, all of it. Uh, that's the tech. That's, that's the infrastructure. And Bitcoin is money is savings it's your it's your disinflationary asset where you store value that's your goal 2.0 uh, maybe google a uh, sailor yeah. in the four quadrants might might show the video it's one of his yeah. videos he talks about it oh sven sven's video sven hendrick 
Oh, that the the, the perma perma doomer guy. Yeah, I, I feel like I, I feel know. like I, I feel like with the like with people like Peter Schiff and like Michael Saylor, they're so extreme that like they kind of pigeonhole themselves to like be either only Bitcoin or like never Bitcoin at all, because uh, that that's their like brand, right? That's their brand. Uh, but yeah, I, I feel like wrong. I, I feel I feel like Schiff owns some Bitcoin. I, I, I feel like how can he not own Bitcoin? Maybe maybe I'm. <laughs> Maybe See, I don't myself, understand. But... Just, just be open minded. I, I, listen, I own gold. I own stocks. I, I don't understand. Like, I have my my distaste for stocks because they're all zombie companies and it's all negative yielding. It's all negative real yields, three percent or whatever. Microsoft will give you minus two percent considering CPI inflation and whatever. I just, I don't understand why people are so <laughs> against everything. I don't understand hating. I don't understand that. All I understand is opportunity. Yeah. Okay. So we're, we're approaching two hours. Uh, okay. This has been a really, wow. really good stream. Yeah. Uh, but I guess to wrap, to wrap things up here, like, is there anything you want to say, like parting words to my audience, whether it be like avalanche crypto or just DeFi in general, like what, like, what do you want my audience to walk away with uh, from, you know, this amazing live stream that we just had? Uh, very, very quickly, you know, there's, there's a lot of opportunity here, you know, be an opportunity maximalist. Um, and also with a lot of opportunity comes a lot of responsibility, you know, recognize that getting rich quick, uh, in a period of a few years, you know, a few months, whatever, uh, is still getting rich very quick. There's no reason to take unnecessary risks, trying to get rich, trying to make it tomorrow. Um, bide your time, wait for opportunity. Uh, when those good opportunities do present themselves, uh, have conviction uh, and go in and go hard. But most importantly, don't get rugged. You know, if you get rugged this early in the game, chasing dumb shit, um, the opportunity cost of that could be catastrophic. Uh, so everybody just be safe. Don't just be aping into new liquidity pairings that just keep popping up right now. It's a very opportunistic environment right now because these scam developers know that people don't have anything to buy. Um, and I've seen several of my friends get rugged already, um, just trying to chase uh, this momentum that doesn't necessarily exist. Uh, there's too many good things coming for you to take those risks. So everybody, please be very, very careful and understand that once again, while you may be front running billions in inflows um, and that this is being vertically accumulated, so to speak, that there will be red days, um, you know, it's inevitable. So, you know, bide your time, wait for those opportunities. And when those opportunities present themselves, have the balls to execute. Yeah, I, I definitely got, I, my first ever rug happened on Avalanche. I, I, I like, I made like, like a five X on Husky. And then I rotated part of that to like, I forgot, like Akita or something. And I got rugged. I, I got rugged. <laughs> in, I got rugged in Avakita as well. <laughs> yeah, 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 that one, that one. Yeah, Avakita. I was so hyped about that one. And just got, went to zero. Anyways, how, how about you know? Like what? Like parting words? I never got rugged. Not once. Not even in DeFi Summer 2020. Go fucking figure. I don't know. I, 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 I have deploy capital, and I have uh, gone for the asymmetric appreciation. I mean, it was like 15 acts on synthetics. That shit was crazy. Those are my first three bags. Um, synthetics, Kyber, and Bancor that just ripped like, anyway, multiples. Um, I leave your stream parting words of wisdom in my old age, my wisdom of 38 years and being in this space for however long I've been by revenue streams. And um, look, extra capital flows in, billions flow in. In five years' time, Avalanche is a, is a meaningful uh, systemic uh, significance, and it's cranking out returns. Da uh, well, two days, they buy back every two days. And you have a revenue stream, and which means you have in five years, you have a salary. And that means you don't necessarily have to work if you've accumulated enough revenue streams. So while it's nice to have that big win, just remind yourself, like if you put a thousand and you walk away with 50 grand, what the fuck are you going to do with 50 grand? You're going to buy something? No, but if, if, if you're, you're able to make five grand a week, you just bought your freedom. You no longer have to work. And to me, that 
that's everything. So I get philosophical with my, my stuff and freedom, you know, people making a big, big windfall isn't necessarily freedom unless you, you know what to do with it. Managing capital is more meaningful than that big windfall. So be careful. All the same sentiment is messy. You guys know what you're talking about. So just uh, w- w- r- watch your risk profile. Watch the rug doctor. Um, time allows you to know if something uh, has a decreased risk profile, which is obviously why you know core Ethereum L1 has a decreased risk profile in many regards. Time tested for over a year and a half at this point. So w- watch the capital inflow. It does make it a target, but it also over time allows a protocol to prove itself. Um, but uh, no reason not to capitalize. Um, just be safe, be smart, ask questions. You know, all three of us are on Twitter. Ask the questions and we're all happy to help because as I say on my stream, we can do better always. Yeah. And I provided a link to Noah, Messi, uh, their Twitter pages, as well as Noah's YouTube channel and Hero Labs, right? Did you want to talk about Hero Labs, Messi? Uh, just to wrap things up. Sure, sure. Briefly, um, you know, Hero Labs is is basically just a um, a, a branch of the Hero ecosystem um, to where you know we're we're attempting to have kind of an all in one media channel um, to where you know we cover a variety of topics uh, with a variety of people. You know, we, I don't, of course, you know, people have their own brands and are very successful, you know, with those brands, but there's not really a a hub. Uh, that I know of yet, um, to where you have all sorts of different content being discussed um, in one place. And that's what we're trying to build out. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, You know, Hero, for those of you that aren't aware, uh, that's HXRO. That's what's behind me. Um, We're building a decentralized options uh, framework on Solana. Uh, Some major players involved in that. Super interesting. Um, Not going to shill it. Just go check it out if, if, you know, decentralized options uh, does suit your fancy. Um, but for sure, come check out uh, Hero Labs. Uh, there's all sorts of experience there, analysts. We have options reports coming soon, um, you know, more and more and more. Our options reports are already available, uh, you know, in, in text format, but we have a, a really smart um, woman who's working with us now that's uh, actually like been on the news, like really, really like Bloomberg and that kind of stuff. Um, and, and we look forward to bringing her content uh, in as well soon. So check us out. You know, I think you uh, you might find you like it or maybe you hate it, but that's your choice. And if, if there's any, if, if, if there's ever like a must watch show that uh, comes up every week, I, I, I'd say it's it's messy as shitcoin church. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> I, I like to I like to let loose. You know, I'm I am a, an absolute joker and clown. Um, you know, and, and I, I enjoy being silly. So, you know, if you if you like those kinds of things, you know, you'll find that on on my shitcoin church show. Yeah, like that. <laughs> spectacular it is yeah yeah, hey, yeah. Well, there we go yeah there we go awesome <laughs> well yeah so it's been two hours of lots of alpha lots of i guess opinions and thoughts shared uh yeah i think we're all bullish avalanche for the obvious reasons um i'd say 10 billion tvl coming in the next month or so uh with all being curved deploying so yeah check out messy shitcoin church he went over like the entire avalanche ecosystem in the past uh, yeah, in, in his two-hour stream, uh, my channel has a bunch of Avalanche videos. And Noah, I'm sure he'll start talking about Avalanche uh, in his daily live stream uh, That's that he does like every, every morning, I believe. So yeah, thank you guys for watching. Um, uh, let me know if in the comment section if you want me to do this type of content more. Usually I do uh, live streams on Sundays just by myself doing presentations, but I'd be happy to bring on more guests uh, like Messi, like Noah, who share the same like mentality as me when it comes to crypto, DeFi, etc. Uh, and I think, yeah, let me know in the comment section below. So thank you for watching. I thank you for watching. And have a good one out there. All right, guys, let's do this more. You know, take you got good content, and you know how to. You're like an ag. You're the one inch.